When we talked about forces, we talked about how things move. Now we're going to talk about their behavior while they're moving. So have you ever wondered when looking at sports, why golfers and bowlers do what's called a follow through or even a baseball swing or a swing of a tennis racket? Why you follow through? What does that mean? Why do skydivers and parkour runners bend their knees upon impact with the ground? And why is falling on a wood floor or into a swimming pool less painful than falling on something cement? What are all these things? What do they all have in common? Well, if you remember Newton's first law, the law of inertia, things that are moving want to keep moving, things that are stopped want to stay stopped until we force them to change. If we look at inertia, which is kind of the laziness, the tendency to keep doing what it's doing, if we look at the inertia of moving objects, that's called momentum, okay? So momentum is the mass related to the mass and the velocity. So something very big would have more momentum, something that's moving very fast would have more momentum, okay? Now, is momentum a vector or a scalar? If you notice, velocity is a scalar where we're moving in a certain direction. So your momentum will also be a vector. That's what those arrows over the top of the P and the V indicate is that it's a vector quantity. It's got a, a direction to it. So you could have, if you think of like football, you could have a momentum of a, a, a football player going this way, and then the other guy that's meeting him has his momentum going that way. Those vectors are going to collide and their momentum will change. And then the units of momentum, well, mass is kilograms and velocity is meters per second. You would think they come up with some cool name for it. There's not, it's kilogram meters per second. So when you see units of momentum, it's kilogram meters per, per, kilogram meters per second. And momentum is represented with that P because M was already taken. <laughs> So let's look at an example. We've got a 50 kilogram cart rolling down the hallway at five meters per second. How much momentum does it have? Momentum is mass times velocity. So you take the mass of 50 times the velocity of five, 50 times five, 250 kilogram meters per second, okay? So 250 kilogram meters per second. I wish I had a cool name. Maybe you could name it when you get older. All right, impulse is um, when you apply a force over a period of time. That's called impulse. Impulse is force times time. So what are the units of impulse? Well, force is measured in newtons. Time is measured in seconds. So like momentum, it's got a boring newton seconds. It doesn't have a cool name to it. Um, but anyway, yes, impulse is measured in newton seconds. So for impulse, you apply a force and you apply it over a period of time. And the longer you apply that force, the more impulse you get. So let's look. A batter hits a half kilogram ball with a force of 200 newtons. If the time of contact was 0.205 seconds, what's the impulse on the ball? Well, we'll take newtons, our force, times our time. So 200 times 0.205, we end up getting 41 Newton seconds, okay? If you want to increase that impulse, maybe the batter can only hit with 200 Newtons. Maybe he's swinging it with all his might. How is he gonna increase the impulse? Increase the time. Now you see the following through. If you follow through and you increase the time of contact, then you increase that impulse, okay? Now look at our units of impulse, momentum, you notice anything, there's newtons and seconds and meters per second and kilograms. If you remember Newton's second law, F equals MA, we start with F equals MA. Now what's acceleration? Acceleration is the velocity divided by the time, right? Remember our, our motion formulas? So we can put velocity divided by time in for acceleration in F equals MA, right? Now let's take that T over to the side, because right now it's over T. We want to get T out of the bottom. So we'll take T and multiply it on both sides. So FT equals MV. Hold on a second. FT is what? Impulse. MV is what? Momentum. So what we're saying with Newton's second law, F equals MA, is that impulse equals momentum.
Now, it's kind of funny because Newton himself actually did this formula first, FT equals MV. He found the connection between impulse and momentum and then rearranged that to find F equals MA. So we're actually working a little bit backwards from what Newton did. But we have found that when you apply an impulse to an object, you change its momentum. Okay, If you want to change the momentum more, make it go faster, make it slower, whatever it may be, then you have to apply either a bigger force or you have to apply it over a longer period of time. So the impulse applied by the force will change the object's momentum, okay? Think about if you're pushing your little cousin on the swing, right? You're pushing your cousin on the swing. Um, if you apply a force, you can either like slap them on the back, right? And that wouldn't make them go higher on the swing or you could push with the swing. The longer you're in contact with your little cousin on the swing, pushing him through, the bigger change they're going to get in their swing, right? So apply a force over a period of time and change the cousin's momentum. You can't walk up and just smack them. Nothing, nothing will happen except you'll get in a bunch of trouble. All right, so if your force is limited, if you only have so much force to give, you're a person, you've got so many muscles, until you get stronger, this is all you've got, right? How can you maximize your impulse? by increasing the time of contact. So golfing, baseball, tennis, increasing the time in which you're in contact with the object will give you a greater impulse and give you a bigger um, change in momentum. Now kind of on the same, same token, if you know that you need a certain change in momentum, you have a um, ball that's flying through the air and you need to catch it, right? Or you've got a skydiver falling out of the sky and they've got to hit the ground and you know that they're gonna stop. How can you minimize the force on the person or on the object whenever you're catching a baseball or whenever you're um, landing by increasing the time of contact. More time, less force. So that's why you bend your knees upon impact when skydiving or doing parkour. That's why they talk about rolling with the punches when you're boxing. Whenever you are in a fight or you're boxing and you get hit, you don't want to be stiff. You want to be loose and roll with the punches so that that force is applied over a longer time, right? Um, crumple zones on cars. You know that the car is going to stop if it hits this wall, but the car is meant to crumple so that you decrease that force by applying it over a longer period of time. Um, running shoes have the squishy foam. Airbags in your car will increase the time of stopping of, of your body. So all of those things are meant to increase the time of impact to decrease the force at any one time. So when we're talking about these things, whether it's landing or, or a car running into a barricade or whatever it may be, we've got a collision going on. And a collision is an interaction between objects that have made contact. It doesn't have to be a violent thing. It could literally be you're catching a baseball. Not a very violent thing, but still you've got a collision of a ball hitting your glove, right? Um, a collision results in forces being applied between the objects. Now remember when objects interact with each other, those forces are equal and opposite to each other. The baseball hitting the glove is the same force, equal and opposite, as the glove um, resisting the baseball, hitting the baseball. So the big difference though is when you look at Newton's laws of motion. So both objects experience forces that are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. One is going to probably lose momentum. One is going to gain momentum. In the case of catching the baseball, the baseball will lose its momentum. It will lose velocity. The glove will gain some momentum. It'll be pushed back when it catches. Um, and so the result of that interaction depends on the masses of your object. So if you've got like, let's say here, the, the club and the golf ball, the least massive object, that would be the ball, will get the greatest change in momentum, the greatest acceleration. The more massive thing will not have much change in momentum at all. The golf club, as it's swinging down, is going a certain speed. When it hits the ball, it might slow down a little bit because it's been hitting that ball. It's losing some of its momentum to the ball. The ball was not moving, now it's got momentum because it's taking off and moving. It's increased its velocity. 
So when you're looking at a system, whether it's the golf club and the golf ball or the baseball in the hand or whatever it may be, in an isolated system where we're just looking at those two objects, we're not looking at everything else, friction, air resistance, and we're just looking at those objects, the total momentum is going to be the same before the collision as after. But one is going to lose and the other is, sorry, is going to gain. So your total momentum will be the same, but one of your objects will reduce the momentum, the other object will gain. So you see our P's down here are two momentums, the momentum of object A and the momentum of object B before the collision. If you combine them, like maybe say this one's got six and this one's got nothing, okay, that's a total of six. After the collision, your objects will have the same total momentum. Maybe this one's four now and this one's two. Still adds up to six, but one lost and one gained, okay? When we have these collisions, there's two things that could happen depending on what happens post-collision. Um, with elastic collisions, both of your objects remain independent. So think about playing pool, right? Playing billiards. You've got the little, um, the eight ball and the cue ball and the six ball and whatever. They run into each other, but then afterwards they're separate. So when you're calculating their momentums, each object remains separate before and after the collision, okay? So here's your, say, cue ball, here's your eight ball. Afterwards, your cue ball has changed its velocity, but it's still an independent object. Your eight ball has changed its velocity, but it's still an independent object. So one will gain, one will lose, okay? The alternative to that is when we have a collision in which they combine together. So we'll look at that in a second. So with an elastic, We've got a half kilogram ball traveling at six meters per second, collides head on with a one kilogram ball moving in the opposite direction at a speed of 12. The half kilogram ball bounces backwards at 14. What is the speed of the second ball after the collision? Okay, so to figure this out, you have to ask it. And if you need to like highlight or label, make a little table, any of that will help. Um, figure out what's ball A and ball B and identify their masses. You can go ahead and put those in. You can put in the velocities that we know and use all that to solve for the velocity that we don't know. So here I am, here's my formula that we've got. I have put in the velocities and the masses that we do know. And notice my 12 and my 14 are negative. Why? Well, because we said they were going in the opposite direction. They were going backwards. When things are going in the opposite direction or going backwards, then we show that with making their, their vector negative. So the half kilogram ball is moving forward at six. The one kilogram ball is coming at it, going the opposite direction at 12. So they've got opposing momentums here. The half kilogram ball will bounce backwards. So it has changed direction. It's not only changed speed, but it's also changed direction quite a bit. How fast is the one kilogram ball going now? Now take a moment, try to solve this, and we'll see if you're right. Okay, so I have simplified. Here's the momentum of ball A, momentum of ball B, momentum of ball A after the collision, and then ball B, we still don't know that velocity. I combine, I subtract, I can solve, and I get my velocity of ball B to be negative two meters per second. It's still going the same direction that it was, but it has slowed down because it gave some of its momentum to ball B to change its motion from going forward to going backwards quite quickly, okay? Inelastic collisions are what I alluded to a second ago, where after the collision, they have combined, they've stuck together. So like catching a ball, we're not stuck, you know, but it, they're moving together as one object. So when you've got things that have combined, whether it's been embedded or caught or whatever it may be, the you treat post-collision those masses as one object. So you can add their masses together. So you see here, here's maybe the ball and the catcher's mitt, um, or maybe a target and an arrow. And after the collision, they've embedded or they've been caught, so they move as one object with one shared velocity. Okay, so let's look at one of these. We've got two freight cars. The freight cars are colliding. One was initially moving, the other was still. They stick together, so they've coupled like freight cars do so that they can take off. What is their final speed? Well, before they're individual objects, 
after they have a shared momentum, so we're gonna combine their masses together, and they'll move off with one velocity. So we'll find the momentum before, before, and the momentum after, and solve for that velocity, okay? All right, so here's our impulse and momentum. Next week, we'll work, look at work and power.